Good evening. My name is Stan Moulton. I'm the chairman of the Northampton Charter Review Committee. I'd like to welcome everyone who is here in our live audience tonight, as well as those of you who are viewing at home or perhaps uh, watching the, this uh, show online. Uh, this is a forum to address election issues in Northampton. I want to give you first a bit of context about the Charter Review Committee. Uh, when the last charter was revised, or when the charter of Northampton was last revised in 2012, one of the provisions uh, is that it be reviewed regularly every 10 years in the year ending in nine, hence the Charter Review Committee 2019. We are uh, a group of nine people. We are uh, one representative from each board. We have also represented the mayor's office, Lynn Simmons, and a, and a, a city councilor, Bill Dwight. Uh, our job is to, uh, is to hear from the people and the officials in Northampton and to recommend <coughs> any changes uh, that we see as needed at this time in the charter. This is a le lengthy process. Uh, we will issue a report by the end of the year, which will then go to the city council and, and to the mayor. Tonight's forum is specifically about election issues in Northampton. Uh, we've invited uh, the city clerk, Pam Powers, to, uh, to, to ad address us. We've invited the Northampton Youth Commission. And we've in invited representatives of uh, Voter Choice Massachusetts who will speak uh, specifically about ranked choice voting. We've also uh, uh, inviting, we're also inviting any of you who are not part of the formal presentations to speak as well. There is a sign-up sheet that right now has three names on it. It will be down at the end of the table here. If you decide during the presentations that you want to address us, please come up, sign up here, and then we'll take people in order that they signed up. Everyone will speak from the podium right there. If you have questions, uh, Please address them to the committee through me, and we'll ask uh, one of the presenters to address that question. And we'd like you to, uh, the presenters will have as a group, uh, each, each presentation will be about 15 minutes long. We'd like to ask you to limit your comments to about three minutes. Okay, so with that, I will ask Pam Powers to start us off. Let's pass that down to the end there. Good evening. My name is Pamela Powers. I'm the city clerk here in Northampton, and I'm here with the Board of Registrars, two out of the three uh, other members. Um, Catherine Kay and Charlie Klopacki are also members of the Board of Registrars. Esteemed members of the Charter Review Committee, Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight about voting measures and how you might help us achieve our goals regarding elections. In the spirit of increasing voter participation in municipal elections, the Northampton Board of Registrars has raised the question concerning whether the city charter can or will address the subject of helping us to increase voter participation in Northampton. Currently, municipal elections are held at least once every other year. The outcome of a city muni citywide mu municipal election will affect every single resident in Northampton. Since 2009, voter turnout for municipal elections has not been higher than 54% with the average voter turnout less than 38%. Our current charter states that the elections shall be governed by the laws of the Commonwealth relating to the right to vote, the registration of voters, the nomination of candidates, voting places, the conduct of, of a preliminary, regular, or special election, the submission of charters, charter amendments, and other propositions to the voters, the counting of votes, and the recounting of votes and the determination of results. One area defined by state law concerns absentee voting. Over the last hundred years, the citizens of Massachusetts have voted three times to amend the state constitution to allow voting other than on election day. As a result, 
the general court was given the authority to provide for voting for those absent from the city on election day, <coughs> those who have a, a physical disability that prevents them from casting their vote at their polling location, or those who hold religious beliefs in conflict with the act of voting on election day. Currently on Beacon Hill, there is a proposed legislation to amend the Constitution that will pave the way for legislators to introduce no excuse absentee voting. House Bill 78 is intended to permit an amendment to the Massachusetts Constitution that would allow the general court to provide a manner of early voting without needing an excuse to do so. I suggest that Northampton take this step without waiting for the state to act. I propose that North Northampton adopt the practice and policy of early voting for all municipal elections. I ask that the Charter Review Committee add the necessary language to the city charter that will allow absentee voting for all municipal elections without needing to declare a reason. But that measure won't help everyone. The question then becomes, how does Northampton ensure that every voice is heard? How do we ensure that the elderly, infirmed, overscheduled parents and grandparents, and disabled voters are provided with the most convenient opportunity to vote? How do we remove nearly every barrier to voting? The state of Oregon tackled this issue over 20 years ago. Every eligible voter in the state of Oregon is sent an, an, a ballot in the mail. Vote by mail provides voter convenience for those who are most vulnerable, including the elderly, disabled, and others. Our system should make voting easier without barriers and not necessarily be available to those whose work and family schedules don't compete with the voting hours or whether a ride is available to get a person to the polls. What about security measures? The former Oregon Secretary of the State and now Governor Kate Brown says that the paper ballot system is the most reliable system because the results can be replicated. She also says that the vote by mail system saves the state 20 to 30 percent in elections. Today, they are considering prepaid postage for the return of the ballot to the clerk's office. Northampton utilizes a paper ballot system. The same security measures we already have in place for absentee ballots can be used to secure vote by mail ballots before casting on election day. The cost? Today, municipal elections cost an estimated $30,000. Whether one voter shows up or 19,000 voters show up, the cost is the same. From 2009 until 2017, on average, 37% of the registered voters voted. On average, that's 7,479 voters. That's $4.01 per voter. Tonight, I asked the Charter Review Committee to consider how our city charter can help us to provide a more convenient, accurate reflection of the will of the entire voter population in Northampton. What about the experience uh, in standing in line at the polls? A delivered ballot two to three weeks ahead of time allows the voter to gather information about the issues, ask questions about the choices, and be better prepared for voting. What about privacy? Voters will have the security of voting in the privacy of their home. I suggest privacy measures can be built into the process once the, voter, once the ballot arrives for counting. As registrars, our objective is to engage the electorate in the election process, to maximize voter participation, and to protect the integrity of the ballots cast. I ask you, should democracy only be available th to those who can fit it in their busy schedule? I hope we can work together to make a voting program that works for everyone. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thanks, Pam. Do, do either of the registrars who are here wish to address us? I can speak for Charlie. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Catherine? Um, no, I think that, that sums up our... Um, Thanks. Okay, now we'll hear from the Northampton Youth Commission. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Margot Shockett Green. I'm the co-chair of the Mayor's Youth Commission. And I'm Tucker Quinlan. I'm the other co-chair of the Mayor's Youth Commission. Do you guys want to introduce I'm, yourselves? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm Noah Cassis, uh, and I'm a 10th grader at Northampton High School and a member of the Mayor's Youth Commission. And I'm Willa Sipple, and I'm the secretary on the Mayor's Youth Commission. We'd really like to thank you all for the opportunity to speak here today and for reviewing our resolution. And um, yeah, so the um, Mayor's Youth Commission has been working on a resolution for over a year now to lower the municipal voting age in Northampton uh, from 18 to 16. So we believe that along with uh, many of the other measures that people are here to speak about today, this would increase voter turnout and participation as well as increase civic engagement from all ages. So the youth of Northampton in particular have proven that they are able to think rationally about the, the human decision of voting in the city of Northampton. They have led the March for Our Lives um, in Northampton, we saw a very big push after devastating school shootings to uh, lead walkouts and to lead protests in order to um, gain more gun control in our country. And so this um, incredible movement was started by the youth of America and the youth in Northampton really responded to this and stepped up to the, stepped up to the table and um, decided to take matters into their own hands. So along with this, they have um, the high school Democrats, among other groups, have organized town halls with state and Senate representatives um, in our local high school. And um, they have proven that the, our representatives really value our voice and our opinions about a variety of issues. And so what we would like to do by lowering the voting age is allow ourselves to be represented in the municipal decisions that affect us. Um, so in these experiences, um, such as organizing town halls and walkouts and protests um, to engage in issues that really affect the youth of Northampton, we have gained a lot of knowledge about how democracy works and about how the um, issue of voting is really crucial. And so we believe that this could increase voter turnout um, as citizens would start the voting process at a younger age. And so if citizens started voting at age 16 instead of 18, they would be in, um, in their high school environment and they would have access to the polls where their parents vote, where their friends vote, where their peers vote, and they would um, be familiar with the voting process before the age of 18 where many kids are moving to college and um, moving to another district in which they would need to register to vote in that district. Um, and as many people say, once you start voting, you don't stop. And so if we could start this process earlier, I think we could really increase the civic engagement and increase voter turnout, not only in the city of Northampton, but as um, these young voters grow up, they would be uh, more informed and more regular voters at the polls. Um, and in high school, we are, we have, in, Ma in the state of Massachusetts, we have, um, civic education requirements. And so at the age of 16, we are um, fully informed of the process of voting and how it impacts our society. Um, we take classes involving politics and we are fully civically engaged in our local municipalities. And so this would, this provides us with the knowledge to vote and um, the youth of Northampton has proved time and time again that this knowledge can um, allow them to be politically engaged and civically engaged. Um, also at the time, of, at the age of 16, we um, are given a lot of responsibility. We are allowed to drive a car, we are allowed to consent to sex, we are allowed to um, be, we are able to be prosecuted as adults in criminal court. Um, and so with all of these responsibilities and privileges, such as driving a car, we believe that we should have the right to have our voice be heard in our town and um, vote on decisions that really impact us. Um, all right, I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair, Tucker. So 
as much as we want to expand the voting rights and work with that, it's also because what we are voting on pertains very heavily to us as students in the Northampton public school system. The largest part of the Northampton municipal budget is the school budget. And most people voting in Northampton did not go through our modern Northampton public school system, but most 16-year-olds living in this city are currently in that system and have been in it for a while. So I think that gives us a certain view into what it's like and voting on that would give us the power to change what we are doing as people through our city. Um, this has also seen success elsewhere. Um, the country of Austria changed their voting age to 16 and they found a study that said younger voters were no less informed than their older counterparts for all of their elections. Um, a common argument uh, when this has been brought up, uh, you know, lots of times, there are a few towns uh, and cities across um, America that have lowered their voting age to 16, but a common argument when people try to lower the voting age is that 16-year-olds will be influenced by their parents, that they'll be too heavily influenced by those around them and, they, and they won't, they, they're not mature enough to form their own opinions. But Speaking from the perspective of being around, surrounded by 16-year-olds all day, I can say definitively that I do not find that to be the point. To be, um, you know, a great example is tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning at 6:50, um, students in Northampton High School are organizing a standout uh, in front of the school to support their teachers in their negotiations, in the teacher union negotiations with the uh, school committee. Um, and I don't see, I don't see only. The people that I see organizing this standout tomorrow aren't only the people that you see here today and the people that you know are most engaged in the Democrats Club and most engaged in um, the environmental movements. But I see people who I, who I didn't even know were interested in this, but I see people who care deeply about their community and who care deeply about how their school is run and how their teachers, you know, their teachers getting a uh, fair wage. And this is true with issues across the board, that that 16-year-olds, I mean, I, I do think uh, nationwide, but especially in Northampton, because I really do think 16-year-olds here are unique, that we, we really have a, a great grasp on the issues that are facing our city and our community and our schools, and we care deeply. And because of all these reasons, 16-year-olds really <coughs> should, should have the same right to vote that uh, 18 year olds have and that adults have and uh, you know I see 16 year olds every day who are who are more informed than adults um, obviously not all 16 year olds but but the truth is that that we are we are deeply uh, informed and deeply affected by what happens in our community and, and we should have the right to have a say in in who's leading our community and and, and the decisions that are being made I'll speak a little bit more about the responsibilities that a lot of high school students I see and I'm surrounded with every day um, uphold. So um, I'm one of the leads of the Sunrise Movement in Northampton, which is a new movement that support the Green New Deal nationwide. Um, and we've already seen from this movement that is the first youth move, the first youth climate movement for the Green New Deal, entirely led by young people. A huge amount of people, a huge amount of young people from the high school are coming out to support and to advocate for their futures. And this is, ties exactly into that. Our futures are like ourselves and we have, we're represented by a very like small amount of people who look like us as young people and who understand where we're coming from. So being able to speak like our truths and our experiences by voting and through the process is really so crucial to having the representation that we need and we like kind of uh, hunger for a little bit uh, as we feel like we don't really have um, as much of a say sometimes in our lives as we really have are responsible for. I believe. So we we hope that you will add language into uh, the new charter. Um, that will make it possible to uh, send to the state house asking that we can lower our municipal voting age to 16, and we would be happy to answer any questions you may have for us. Does anyone on the committee have any questions? <clears throat> Thank you for your presentation. 
I don't know if this is on. All right. Um, certainly, I, I find myself at the high school fairly regularly um, participating in things that you folks have sponsored. So the question of where your priorities lie is certainly not one that I have. Um, I would like to ask you two, two questions, though. Um, one is you just heard that the average turnout among enrolled adult voters is 38 percent. Do you have any idea how many of your colleagues would vote if they were given the chance? Um, so previously at, um, let's see, bake sales or pretty much any event that the Youth Commission holds or the high school Dems, we have a stack of um, pre-registration forms. And people are actually coming to this bake sale, not for the brownies, but for the registration forms. And I would say everyone I know in the high school who is not 18 yet is pre-registered to vote. People are excited to vote. People are um, really engaged in the process and are eager to have the opportunity to have their voices heard. And even if they can't vote, I hear people all the time asking, um, my peers all the time asking adults, well, who are you going to vote for? I want to have this conversation with you. Even though I don't have a say in this um, municipal election, I want to have my voice be heard by someone. I would like to discuss the pros and cons of this candidate. Um, and so I think that young people are really, really excited to vote. And um, as far as percentages, I would say definitely more than 38% of my peers would jump at the chance to go stand in line at the polls. I hope that would be the case. So, in your American history classes, you've probably learned that we were founded due to a complaint about um, taxation without representation. Have you heard that before? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, in essence, are asking for representation without taxation. Do you have a comment on that? Well, well. I'm not sure that's necessarily true. Yeah. I have a lot of peers that have jobs, uh, and they're taxed on all the income that they get. So and if you they are contribute to the economy in Northampton, um, a lot of you can see a lot of teenagers out and about in Northampton buying things, paying tax, getting food, paying tax, upholding jobs, paying tax. And so this, these are all the ways in which we are contributing. And when we have a job, we are contributing to the economy. And so um, in that, I don't think that it's um, true that we want to be representative, represented without paying tax. Um, and that actually is not a um, qualification for voting in this country. It's just citizenship and age. Um, among, the, among the percentage of your peers that you anticipate will vote, how many of them do you think are adequately informed on the issues that they're going to be voting on? A hundred percent. Thank you. And I, I, I would say, if not necessarily like 100%, definitely no less percentage than the percentage of adults that vote. <laughs> 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 and going off of um, what Martha was saying, I think, I think one of the reasons that, that I think that if, you, if the voting age were to be lowered to 16, the fact that the voting age were lowered to 16 was lower to 16, and the fact that like our whole city was like making this whole big step would, would mean that I think every 16-year-old that I know would be out voting because it would be such an amazing opportunity to start voting when you're 16 and to be able to have a say in you know Northampton being this city that is saying, okay, we, tr we trust our youth to help us make the decisions for our town because, yeah, the truth is that it, it, you know some of the people who are the most affected are, are the youth. Any other committee members uh, have questions? I have a quick question. Thank you very much. Um, I'm curious as to um, what factor your exposure to civics in junior high or high school played into your being here, if, if at all, and, and at what age um, you recall having an interest or starting to understand how our government works. I think, at least for me, it started in middle school. I was taking my first real history class as an eighth grader and learning about how our country was formed. And that made me interested in how our country runs and how our city runs and why do I not get a say in this. And then when I got to the high school, I found out about the Youth Commission and got involved immediately. And actually, my first year there was the first year that we talked about this resolution to lower the voting age. 
and it's been something that I've been thrilled about ever since. Yeah, I would really like to speak to that. Um, in entering Northampton High School, um, I came from a very small school, and I wasn't exactly sure how to make my voice heard. Um, but I knew that I needed to um, make myself heard in such a big community where I couldn't vote and where um, most of the adults I spoke to um, weren't interested in hearing my political opinions. So um, when I found the Youth Commission, I was um, really struck by how we could make a difference and by what an impact our voices could make. And so in getting more involved, I saw that all of these people who are involved in all different groups are actually finding a way to make their voice heard in the community. And the community trusts them with that. Um, the community trusts the youth to advocate for gun reform, um, something that is primarily led by youth. So the community is trusting us with that. Um, and so this was a way in which I found my voice could be heard. And I found that um, I was educated enough to take this step and represent my fellow peers. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for your thoughtful presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And now we'll hear from a uh, representative of Voter Choice Massachusetts. Just one moment, sorry. Is it possible we could turn the overhead lights down and go off? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you see your note? Could I uh could I have a bit of Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does that work? That works for me. Okay. Um, okay. Yes, thank you very much and good evening. My name is Howie Fain. I'm the Deputy Director of Policy and Research for Voter Choice Massachusetts. And let me make sure we got this. Okay. Um, all right. We are having a momentary technical problem. I apologize. If you, if you would, just me, give, give us a moment. That external, Andy. The the pad won't work. You want me to get that? Yeah. 
we can make it in miniature like that. Maybe. All the animations won't work. Let me get that. Yes, excuse me. I hate PowerPoints. No, I <laughs> just get clear. Claire was going to have a lot. <laughs> drafting an ordinance banning all use of power. <laughs> Which we'll, we should probably consider a charter review. Yeah, we could put this in the chair. <laughs> suggest this to the chair. <laughs> Is there a 16 year old in the house? Dan? Can we ban PowerPoints in the charter? <laughs> Thank you for your patience. So, my name is Howie Fain. I'm the Deputy Director of Policy and Research of Voter Choice Massachusetts, nonpartisan, politically diverse, nonprofit organization. We advocate for electoral reforms, and these words are important, part of our mission statement, that increase, increase the range of choice on the ballot and produce fairer outcomes for all. It's great to follow these presentations that involve um, more voter participation, being heard, involvement, and that's what really this is all about on ranked choice voting, which we'll be presenting tonight. Sorry, that was a little early. So you each have a copy of our report, Upgrade Local Elections with Ranked Choice Voting. And it's a summary of how every city and town in Massachusetts, whatever its current governmental structure, can consider putting ranked choice voting in. And that's what we'll be discussing tonight. In New Hampshire, in Northampton, um, most of your um, elected offices are single winner elections. But there are some that are at large with up to three seats being filled for trustees and superintendents and the like. And um, I will all be talking about ranked choice voting, but I will be spending some time focusing on those at large seats because that's less familiar to people. As ranked choice voting has sort of come on the political scene in a big way, there's a, um, you, we're going to pay attention to how that works as a variant of ranked choice voting for your at-large as well as for all your single seat elections. And I'm going to also note that the city is well positioned to implement ranked choice voting, RCV I'll be calling it, with your recent purchase of Dominion's ImageCast precinct machines, which offers a software upgrade with a fully integrated RCV suite of ballots, scanning, tabulation, and results reporting. So you're in good shape on that score. Of course, that all means that there's a lot here, so I look forward to answering your questions um, following my presentation. And when we introduce RCV, Ranked Choice Voting, to people largely unfamiliar with it, which I know is probably not the case for most of you on this committee, we use a series of examples from actual elections to illustrate the problem of what is known as plurality voting. Voters pick one candidate, the candidate with the most votes, but not necessarily a majority of the votes, is then declared the winner. Our examples run from US president all the way to select board member in the small towns, and nomination contest as well as general elections. It cuts and across all effects on all political parties, groups of voters across the political spectrum. What they all have in common with those examples that we typically use, and I'm only going to share a few um, tonight, is the cloud of the spoiler effect that when multiple candidates run for a single office, the democratic goal of determining a winner supported by a majority of the voters is compromised. The spoiler effect compromises the right of a candidate to freely run and be heard. It compromises the right of voters to freely vote for who they want, uh, to freely vote for who they most prefer from the fear of helping to elect the candidate they least prefer. And when the final results are in, 
It allows for the election of someone who has not demonstrated and perhaps might not be able to demonstrate that they truly had the support of a majority of voters. That's because vote splitting, two or more candidates with similar positions and overlapping support splitting that support between them. A candidate who might have won with majority support had other candidates not entered the race can end up losing because they did. So we've been talking about participation. The more particip participation by candidates, sometimes the adverse results. So we're going to start with a city election in Massachusetts that took place last month in Fall River. You may have heard about this. Mayor on the left, 13 count federal indictment. Citizens organize a recall election. He's entitled to his day in court, but the voters were entitled to their day of democracy and they didn't get it because more candidates ran than, quote, should have. He was in a 61% vote, he was recalled. On that same day, voters, he was one of five choices to be elected, for, to compete for the mayor, now open mayoral slot. 64.5% of all Fall River voters said they don't want this gentleman to be their mayor. But because of the plurality system, that's exactly what happened, and he's now sitting in office. This is what happens when people run, people vote, split votes, and the like. Now I'm going to switch then to the well-known example from the U.S. presidential election. Look at the national scene in Florida in 2000. 537 vote difference between the two major party candidates and um, another candidate in the race. No one wins a majority. No one clears 50 percent. What happens is we have a classic case of vote splitting and the result just by naming one person winning the most votes but not the majority support the winner. But there's another situation that applies here. We black out that other candidate, Ralph Nader, and we start to say, we don't have to imagine what might have been the second choices. Voters were asked, what would you do if Ralph Nader was not in the election? What if his 100,000 votes weren't there? Essentially they were, who would you vote for? strong majority of those with a preference supported Al Gore and the election would have been different. The question is, we didn't have a chance to find those second choices and the candidate merely for running and wishing to be heard and the voters who said that's who I prefer, they're called spoilers. It's an ugly term. It's against participation. It's against involvement. People should have a right to be heard and voters should have a right to vote and then we should get the democratic outcome. So of course the dynamics, uh, uh, you know, um, of course the dynamics of nonpartisan municipal elections, such as those held in Northampton, seem like a far cry from those in a presidential race, and for the most part, they are. But the principles are not. Any election in which three or more candidates compete for a single seat or office risks the election of someone who has not demonstrated support from a majority of voters. It risks would-be candidates choosing not to run, and voters being forced to strategize about assigning their vote rather than simply voting for who they most prefer. <coughs> and that's why this whole concept of spoiler votes is why Northampton, as do most cities in Massachusetts, hold preliminary elections to pare down the field. So whenever there are more, candidate, more than twice the number of candidates for the number of seats to be filled, as you're all familiar with, there's a preliminary election to winnow down that field. So it's true. If only two finalists are on the general election ballot for mayor, then yes, it's guaranteed that one will be a majority winner in that particular contest. Faced with only two finalists to choose from, voters too are freed from strategic considerations. Preliminary elections seem to negate the spoiler effect. But that is not necessarily the case. Now we switch to a city election across the state, Boston, mayoral preliminary, 2013, 12 candidates. It's an it's a, it's a, um, interesting time in Boston. It's the first time communities of color constitute a majority of the population. It's also the first time there was an open seat in the mayoral office in 20 years. 12 candidates jumped in. The top two, as you're full, very well familiar from the preliminary election, are going to compete in the general election. There's concern in the city that candidates of color 
will split their votes. Too many of them are running. What happens? Nothing against white Irish guys, but two of them at 18 and 17 percent make it into the final general election. Charlotte Gola Ritchie on the lower left was presumed to be the front runner among candidates seeking to just put a whole new feel of voice and choice into the election. And as, as were other strong candidates, Arroyo and Barros specifically, candidates of color might have split the vote, thereby preventing any from making the top two. Third is not good enough in this situation. So this raises the question, with ranked choice voting, a city or town could bypass the preliminary election. And so when I said preliminary elections mostly or largely solve that question of vote splitting and majority, it doesn't do it well enough. And we would like to suggest for Northampton the same concept. Instead hold what is a single higher turnout, and I'll be talking a little more about that, general election instead of using the preliminary. Now maybe Northampton isn't used to such crowded fields. Preliminary elections um, aren't always needed. And when I've re reviewed the election results of the, of, of the city. But that could change and it will fluctuate. It must, it will. More voices and more choices should always be a good thing in elections. Not an, oh no, now we need to have a preliminary election. And the state legislature receives requests from cities. We have one over the limit. Can we, you know, can we get a waiver? This is just not the business we should be in when there's such a reasonable alternative. The fact that ranked choice voting eliminates the need for preliminary elections, regardless of the size of the field, is one reason to adopt RCV, even if there were no others. Yes, we, as we've shown, RCV will do a better job of preventing vote splitting that could affect election outcomes. But on cost savings alone, RCV is a superior choice. Extending that, RCV results provide an excellent accounting of voters' real preferences. They can be used to fill vacancies from the prior election rather than having to hold special elections. You have a complete record of what the voters wanted in the form of their ranked preferences. Cambridge across the state is a Massachusetts city that has not had to hold a preliminary election or a special election for nearly 78 years in that, has, that it has been successfully using ranked choice voting to elect its at-large city council and school committee. And there's yet another good reason. General elections have significantly higher turnouts than preliminary elections. And as far as I can tell, Northampton is no exception to that. There's a big difference in turnout and who's making critical decisions going into a preliminary election when the field is large. <coughs> I'm going to talk about how ranked choice voting works, and people have different degrees of familiarity with it, and how does it safeguard the intent of the voters, and how does it have, allow voices to be heard? So we're going to go over some of these details and its benefits. But also, I'm going to do that with the single winner, uh, what's called an instant runoff. And then I'm going to, because of your at-large seats, spend some time talking about that as well. So what has shaken the ground about electoral reform and pushed ranked choice voting so far forward is the state of Maine, which is not a municipal election. But I'm going to focus on that a little bit. I'm going to show you the ballot when Maine in 2016 adopted and after, um, and by 2018 was using it for their primary elections and then used it for their general elections. And I'm going to use some examples from Maine because they beautifully tailor the type of results that can happen the, um, with ranked choice voting. That's all you do is you rank in order of your preference. The first choice goes to your most preferred candidate, second, et cetera. It's as easy as one, two, three, and that's a ballot. I'm going to go through a couple of elections. Oh, first, um, just describe the sequence. Some, many of you are familiar with it. You count the first choice votes. Does any candidate have a majority? Yes. The election's over. There's a majority winner. But if not, if someone has less than half, uh, less than the, um, over a majority, then the election's not over. You eliminate the last place candidate. They've had their shot. They've been heard. The voters have spoken. They, they're not going to make it. They get eliminated and their ballots transferred to their next higher preference. Count the votes again. Does anyone now have a majority? Yes, election's over. If not, another round. Basic process. 
Let's take a look at a, three, three races from Maine just show what happens. Does anyone have a majority in this Republican gubernatorial primary? Sure, Sean Moody, 56.6%. What happens? Election's over. Winner. No muss, no fuss. All right? Democrats, seven candidates. No one has a majority. Exactly a third, 33.3 is the highest. They're competing for support. They have the strength of their um, core support there and their first choices. And no one has a majority, so we continue. We're going to drop from the bottom. Just want to acquaint you with one specific thing Maine uses and many others are using in ranked choice voting. The three lowest candidates together total less than 8%. There's no way they can win, even if the third, you know, high, the highest among them got all the transfers from below them. Maine uses batch elimination. Fewer rounds, actually. They're gone. They couldn't make it. And now they distributed second choice. You can see this one's a pretty even distribution. No, no market patterns. Fourth place, he's in, he's in last place now. He didn't get enough of those to, uh, to you know, advance. He's gone. Again, actually, a fairly even distribution. But still no one has a majority. One more round, and we see that we have a winner with a majority. This is the person who was leading after the first choices. If this was a plurality election at 33.3%, we'd have no way of knowing whether there was a majority mandate, whether that person had support. But Janet Mills, now current governor actually, was able to demonstrate the strength of that first choice support as well as holding her own or more than holding her own on those second and third choices and this the majority mandate is conferred. One more, a lot of news attention. Incumbent Republican um, Congressperson uh, Poliquin, Jared Golden. Um, a Democrat opposing from the major parties and two independent candidates. They didn't do so well, and Maine has a strong independent tradition. But no one has a majority, less than a percentage point. We could have, it could have stopped. But instead, they said, the ranked choice voting says, let's look at the preferences of those who ran at, uh, at, uh, by the voters who supported those other independents. And when you look at that, we had the reversal. So we had one winner on the first round. We had another winner who was the plurality leader. Nothing long, you know, wrong with that. And then we had this where the second place finisher on first choices turned out to have not only deep support on first choices, but broad support on second um, and third, and is elected. So this is significant um, about Maine. And so now, let's just, about the benefits of RCV, Negative campaigning, that's, that's in reference to a national campaign. Very practical reason. It changes the nature of the campaign. More civility, less negative, less attacks, because with RCV, going negative costs you second choice votes. So now switching from the national, that cartoon involving um, Trump and Clinton, you know, small town door knocking, door to door, come up, see the sign of your opponent, without, under polarity, no good, you're gonna leave. Under RCV, this is just a practical way in which this works and is shown to work in practice all the time. See the sign, knock on the door, this is what I stand for, this is where I agree, this is where our positions are the same, this is where we differentiate. Would you please consider me for support, even if you're with Orange, can you please consider me for your later vote? Classic, and the studies are piling up to show that the nature of the campaigns are changing under ranked choice voting. And then this is the mayor of, who won a, from a large field in Maine. It, we won't be able to hear that because it's not plugged in. Um, the, the key words are to the right, Mayor um, Betsy Hodges. There was relatively little elbowing and, elbowing and attacking because every candidate wanted to be the second choice of their opponent supporters. And she's just speaking about her own experience in that field and being a successful candidate. So it changes the nature of things. Higher turnout, ranked choice voting is absolutely correlated with higher turnout. No new voter errors is a sort of funny way of saying that, but people have been making errors on their ballots forever. You know, two-person race, you can overvote and, and have two um, ovals filled out. No additional consequence at all. People are comfortable with ranking their choices. You saw the ballot, you fill in the oval, first choice, second choice, third choice. And so, um, and uh, greater diversity um, from a whole bunch of places, people of color elected pre and post RCV implementation. This is what's happening in the movement for ranked choice voting. 
there's our list. It's a good one about spoilers and vote splitting, encouragement, negative campaigning, more voice and more choice. This is, you'll notice Cambridge way on the left, that's since 1941, but then computerization happened right at the beginning of this chart in 1997 and that's when RCV took off in various places. And right at the end there's more waiting uh, adoption, waiting implementation and Amherst is right there. Uh, 2021 probably will be enacted, it will be implemented. And what's significant about this graph also is much of that movement up the steps there is for the single winners similar to your mayors and city you know, ward councilors and the like. Minneapolis, um, and a Amherst is going to have two per elected per district in the multi-winner form and three at large. Minneapolis, I just want to alert you to, is um, right there, it's a little hard to see, but they have a two-person board of taxation estimation, estimation and taxation and a three-person uh, park at large election for park and recreation. Um, commissioners, and I just want to say that's a place to look that is actually using, you know, these uh, multi winner four boards and commissions active in the United States today. So when we talk about the multi winner seats now, which I'd like to do, I want to start with an example just to take you through this. I think you saw the flow chart of the do we have a majority winner? If not, um, do these rounds eliminate from the bottom? There's slight variations on this. And the effects of at-large voting are not necessarily as well known. I want to share these. This is a hypothetical number of voters with different shares. What do you notice about the pie chart overall in the shades is that green has a 60% majority support of people who have a preferred green candidate and blue has 40%. And what we're going to demonstrate is what the problem is in what's plurality at-large voting, plurality um, yeah, plurality block voting at large. And what are the effects and how does RCV fix that? So you see these different levels. We're going to talk as if this is a cohesive group within a color and semi-polarized you know, across the colors, um, different groups of voters. So that's a 60-40 split. What Northampton currently uses, and most at-large jurisdictions do, that haven't switched to ranked choice voting, is block voting. If you there are three seats, you get three votes. The implication of that is the majority can sweep all seats. Everyone cast their, the majority cast their three votes for majority preferred, you know, for those candidates and <coughs> all three. So the question about at large is, districts are great because you know there's a um, geographic area. It's the candidate will be and the voters will be. But there are citywide perspectives, and there are voters over there who might want a perspective, you know, a candidate from over there. At large is used as an alternative to districts to say, let's hear from people from throughout the city or our jurisdiction. The question is, who are they hearing from? And when you give three votes to elect three seats, you have the risk of not hearing from everybody, and that's called block voting. So if we look at this, and again, we're talking about cohesive blocks. A, B, and C, and that's oversimplified for sure. A, B, and C, the green candidates, they, all three votes went to them. What happens on the um, uh, DEF, uh, par partial, um, part, um, the preferred voters, they're voting for those candidates, and that's where the 60-40 split can result in zero representation for the DEF people. That's why the Voting Rights Act looks askance at at-large voting. That's why Holyoke has had a voting rights action and, and Lowell right now on its nine at-large council is engaged in voting rights litigation because of this effect. But there's another part. Not everyone uses their votes, all their votes. I looked at an election in Northampton and I, I saw in, in, in our upgrade uh, manual that you have there, uh, that refers to a Boston election where 39% of available votes in that large election were not used. That's exactly what I came up with looking through you know, one of the Northampton um, elections for a three seat thing. They, people are foregoing them. Why are they? Because voting for one of your lower choices could actually hurt your first choice. That's the strategic value of it. It's not without merit as a strategy. But think of what happened if you recall, those green had 60% 
but it was very concentrated behind one favorite candidate, all right? Really blew away that field, 38%. But if that person's getting most of these bullet votes, then the others, the other Greens, aren't getting their share at all. And we have a lopsided, not, you know, the block voting, when everyone used all three, shut out the minority. Here, the minority 40% won two, thir you know, two thirds of the seats. All because of strategy and what will happen here and there in effect, and these are the flaws of at large voting, among others. Ranked choice voting does it differently. It's still the at large seats, and um, a bullet, I'm sorry, I had more bullet voting examples, sorry. And so the typical ABC voter would have voted for that A. The typical DEF voter I, about, uh, back here was E, one of the strong candidates among that blue, and others more likely to do with D. And that is what resulted in this backwards result with the bullet voting. Now, oh, there I go. Rank choice voting. Rank all candidates in order of preference. Our examples are going to st still be that green favors green and blue favors blue. Oversimplified because real voters have other ways of doing things, but patterns do emerge. And you right away see order and rationality in the outcome, all right? You want it at large so that the whole city can come together and vote on issues and concerns and connections and perspectives, and it comes two to one based on the support um, for the candidates. This time, so we will show ABC preferring ABC. Again, that A is the strongest candidate and is wiping up lots of votes. And they're going to cast their votes for the other because they're going to rank all. In ranked choice voting, you can rank as many or as few as you want. But let's say everyone's here saying, sure, I'll rank them all. It could be a different way. A might be the second. But the point is they're sticking with their major preference group. When we look at the other side, we also see they rank one, two, and three, and they're ranking through. No matter how many permutations I put up here, we're going to have those preferences reflected in two seats for this, you know, the majority of voters, the 60% of voters, and one seat for the 40%. That's what's different about block voting. That's what's different than strategically doing bullet voting that distort results. This is how the at-large um, takes care of that. So we already explained how it, your, um, and I have another minute, maybe I'll zip through something, how your, um, the single districts can, you know, we, and the single elections and mayor, you can eliminate the preliminary and you can get that majority winner. This is how it works with at-large, to represent fully, because that's the goal of the at-large, is to hear from the city as a whole, not just where you live. Let's take a quick look of how it works. Everyone knows the word majority, and we know that it's over half, but there's a threshold. And we're gonna talk about thresholds for the two and three seats, but look how simple this is. Why do we have call it a threshold when it's over half? If one candidate gets over half, it, and 50% won't do, right? It has to be over 50%. If one candidate has a majority, has, has over, 50% over half. Is there room for another candidate to have the same amount? No, if one has over half, there can't be another one that has over half. That's the meaning of threshold. We use it all the time, but we don't think about it. We have to think about it, but it's very simple when we get to your city council and school committee at large seats and the various three seat at large. Let's just think about it the same way. If two seats up, and you notice we've lowered the threshold to a third so we don't waste any votes on someone who can't use it to be elected, <coughs> greater than a third. If two candidates have greater than a third, can another candidate have one of those seats? Equal them? No, mathematically we're out of options. We're over two thirds, that means no one can have that same amount. We don't waste any votes. That, you're gonna hear this concept of the threshold and for the multi-winner seats, and that's as simple as it is. It's greater, it's, as long as you're just over that one-third, just as if you can be over the one-half, you're elected, and no one else, you know, more than two cannot be elected. 
For your three seat elections, same exact thing. Three candidates have just over one fourth. No mathematician in the world can come up with a way for a fourth candidate to have equal. So we've wasted no votes, been spare and spartan in, in making sure they're effective and going to the um, candidate who can most use it to be elected. And that's the concept. In both, each voter is entitled to just a single vote. But by being able to rank their choices, they have the best chance to make it an effective one. And that's true for all ranked choice the best chance to make that vote work for your preferences. Let's just go right through this. These are based on the 100 people voting in that same proportions you saw. We're going to put the threshold that I just explained for three seats, and we're going to raise it to the next whole number, and that's 34. Remember, one, a little more than one-third, but we raise it to 34. What do you notice about that strong candidate A? They've got more than they need. And the principle of ranked choice voting that you don't waste votes that can be used to elect someone come into play. That's extra. That's surplus. That is what could have resulted in the blue getting two seats that one slide we saw when they really should have only had one. And green, if green, blue is balanced. Green is not. People might have said, I don't want to vote for A. They, uh, you know, um, they, they, um, they don't need it. Well, what if everyone thought that an A so popular wasn't even getting elected at all? What are we going to do with that surplus? Look at the second choices, and there's a mathematically precise way to know exactly where they go. You remember in our simplified version, the green is connecting with green and choosing green, and blue is choosing blue. So now, B, after being pretty low because A was so popular, is now doing much better. And we're about to restore balance to that at-large election. Let's see what happens next. Now, the last one, F, is the lowest. Now we're right back in, eliminate from the bottom. No surprise, goes to blue. No, it's, a it's a tight race, all right? But remember, 60% of the voters favored green. Let's see how this is going to work out. We're going to eliminate the bottom, green. Going to put it now. Order is restored again towards that 60-40 balance. But now D, of, of the blue candidates, E has, um, is that say, okay. Um, yeah. uh, sorry about that um, <laughs> mistake there. Um, and we're going to drop the first D. <laughs> sorry about that. As I said, 30, at, when, when, when the second D, <laughs> otherwise known as E, reaches the threshold, they are declared elected. As we said, everyone's voting all the candidates, and the last one's elected because of the rounding and these few numbers. That's it. Two greens have been elected. One blue has been elected. You've done your outlawed voting. You're not overrepresenting one or underrepresenting another. This is the way the votes work out. This is the companion on the outlarge to what you know as the instant runoff voting for the single seat for the mayor to get the one person. So we have no preliminary elections. We get this all done. And this is why Northampton, with its current charter, uh, assuming there's no other changes to your single seats, your at-large seats, this is why ranked choice voting is the right thing at the right time for Northampton. And I thank you very much and would um, welcome any questions. OK, th thanks very much for that uh, presentation. While we're. While the committee is reassembling, let me say again that um, after, after we see uh, if there are questions for you, we'll have audience participation. Annie, would you hold up the sign-up sheet, please? Thanks. Uh, anybody who hasn't signed up yet who has decided they want to address us, uh, please come up and add your name to that list, and then we'll take you in the order in which you have signed up. Uh, committee questions? Yes, Bill. Uh, as speaking, I believe, yes, I am the only at-large person here. And I have been elected as an at-large at -large, uh, counselor, but the the cogent point that stuck with me, uh, you know, one of the difficulties that I experienced during campaigning was the novelty of the bullet vote, as you described, and um, I, I found it particularly 
noisome and distracting and in fact actually spent a good portion of my th third campaign promoting the fact that everyone had two votes and that they were they should feel obliged to use it. It was a heavy lift. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I did notice, and as you said, bullet voting can't be completely eliminating this because you can be entitled to just one vote. I mean, you can choose to just use one vote for one in candidate. In ranked choice voting. Yeah. That's correct. That's a privilege, yes. Yeah. So, so it, privilege it, does, it, it could still play as a strategy for some candidates if they wanted to play that. No. That Thank I'm, you. That's, that's that, what I was wondering. That I'm going to disagree with. Okay. Um, but there is the strategy, because there's logic under the current system that you can hurt your first, first choice right. by casting that second vote. It is impossible to do that with ranked choice voting. Your, your, your later choices cannot hurt because um, it, you know, if, if it's only if you've lost and you're being eliminated right. or someone has already kept their first choices, they don't lose them because they're still in contention. No, you cannot hurt. So the, the, when I say as many or as few as you want, it's some people, let's use that presidential election, walked into that booth even if there had been ranked choice voting, right? right. And they said, uh-uh, I know exactly what I'm doing. I don't want those two, I want this one. That, so in ranked choice voting, no one makes you rank. But um, some, in the direction of 90% of, of voters in all ranked choice voters elections choose to rank multiple candidates. Some go deeper, that seven candidate field. Some went to the, you know, six or seven. Some did two or three. But it cannot hurt at all. That is, that is the beauty of the system. I mean, that, I find that particularly heartening, to be honest. I, that, I, that, I find that heartening. I, I, I think it, I, so far you've made a, uh, a plausible case for more efficacious and more honest voting, so on. Yeah. So I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Other, other questions from the committee? Thanks very much Thank for, you for uh, attending. <laughs> Annie, will you announce the first person on the list and then bring me the sheet? Liz Popolo. Liz Popolo. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Popolo. Um, I'm a member of Voter Choice Massachusetts and um, in, in studying this issue and looking into a lot of data from around other parts of the country where ranked choice voting is being used, um, I just wanted to add a few um, bolstering benefits. So um, in 21 different states, ranked choice voting is being used in some form or another. That includes a dozen cities that are using it in um, oftentimes at-large elections um, and multi-winner scenarios. And um, in all these, you know, um, tens and dozens and hundreds of use cases, the data shows that voters overwhelmingly prefer to use ranked choice voting um, when once they've had the opportunity to become acquainted with it, and they find it easy and intuitive to use it. It's, it's really similar to the way we cognitively look at differences between options. Most people look at, um, as a, at a range of options, not as a binary <coughs> choice, but as a series of, well, if I can't have this one, I'd, I'd rather have that one over the other, right? It's a very natural, intuitive thing for voters to do. And even using it for the first time, um, on, on a ballot with multiple choices, most voters, the uh, vast majority of voters, have no problem and, and make no errors. Um, and this, there's a lot of data, uh, especially from up in Maine, where it was recently implemented in 2018, and voters, um, this, the League of Women Voters of Maine actually did a lot of studies that you can look to for seeing the way that, um, that voters preferred to have this, this option of ranking and to see how many voters actually did go through and use the rankings. Um, as, as Howie mentioned, um, I think over 87% of voters actually did use the rankings. So from other cities where it's being used in other states, we've gotten best practices for how to do good voter education, um, how to do native language translation for, for non-English speaking voters, and 
We've also seen a lot of um, data coming in from how voter turnout is boosted in certain cases 10% um, or higher, including cities like Santa Fe, that, saw, that we're seeing a, a long, slow decline in voter turnout after RCV is implemented, suddenly a boost back up. So I think that's no coincidence. Um, voters having the preference, having the option to use their preferences get more excited. They see more candidates that they like and they want to come out for. And candidates um, aren't afraid to run anymore, so there are more options that attracts more voters from different bases. So. Uh, kind of a, a virtuous cycle, if you would, of encouraging more voices and more choices. Thanks. Thank you. Annie, who's next? <coughs> Rachel Naismith. Rachel? You can pass that down to me, Annie, if you'd like. Hi. <laughs> it, it should pick you up. I'm Rachel Naismith from Florence. I'm a member of uh, Indivisible Northampton, and I've been really taken by the idea of ranked choice voting. So I've been volunteering, making some calls for Voter Choice Massachusetts. And I think that ranking candidates really ensures that as many voters as possible vote for candidates that they really want to win. It's working very well in Maine and other communities as has been said. Um, I think it really helps voters who are torn between two different candidates, as I have been in several elections. And it allows you to vote with your heart. And instead of spending your time strategizing and trying to figure out, well, cognitively, which would ensure this or that, you can vote with your heart because you know that you can rank your choices. I think this removes some of, the, some of the cynicism in politics, and these days I think that's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen Foster. Hi, I'm Karen Foster. I am in Northampton. First, I wanted to thank you all for taking this opportunity to, to hear from all of us. The presentations were so informative and so helpful And going through the charter. Um, I have a lot more to say than I could say in three minutes, but um, what I, one thing that um, you know, I think is so important about each of these, um, you know, whether we're talking about expanding voting to early voting, um, mail-in voting, um, reducing the voting age to 16, ranked choice voting, all of that has this opportunity to bring more people into the process. Um, I spend uh, large amounts of, of my time with people who are in kind of marginalized um, populations and, and people who feel fairly disenfranchised. And it, kind of, it really hurts my heart when I hear people say, oh, the government, like, like the government is these people over here, um, but it's actually, it's, it's us. And I think anything we can do to bring more people into the process and to hear more voices is important. And I think with the Charter Review, you know, something, it, it can feel like, like kind of small potatoes, Northampton is one town, but I think it's, it's a real opportunity to make a progressive and bold choice as, as we're looking at all of these topics and, and thinking about expanding um, voting, I think you all have an opportunity really to, to take a departure from what's always been done to really look at what might actually be best for Northampton. And, and if the sky doesn't fall in Northampton as changes are made, maybe that will have a ripple effect um, to other communities, both in Massachusetts and, and then larger. So um, thank you for doing this. Thank you. Uh, Doreen Weinberger. Hi, uh, Doreen Weinberger from Florence. Um, I want to say that I'm a very, very strong supporter of ranked choice voting, and what little free time I've had in the last few years has gone to working as hard as I can to try to get that implemented here in Massachusetts. So 
I'm obviously a very strong supporter, and I really can't add much to the excellent presentation that you heard, as well as the comments from previous speakers, um, but I hope you will consider what they all had to say very strongly. And I'll just uh, add that I believe in the last uh, election, the um, ballot initiative that was in place for a number of communities, including Northampton, ranked choice voting, I believe, got over 70% in virtually every municipality that it was on the ballot. So I just wanted to remind you of that as well. So I believe there really is a lot of strong support out there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Helen Armstrong. I'm Helen Armstrong, age 82, and I live at the Lathrop, um, and I came in second in the spelling bee two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to say that I'm very impressed with our youngsters that they made a very cogent set of arguments for voting at 16. And we have to think about what they're facing into in this century. All of them were born in the 21st century. And the climate crisis is going to land on their generation especially hard. So they deserve to be listened to when the Sunrise Movement especially, which is led by teens, is so articulate and aware of what's at stake for them. And I, I'll, I won't be here very long myself, but I want to support youngsters to have a voice that I'm probably not going to have many more years. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Now, this is an opportunity, if there's anyone else in the audience who hasn't spoken who wishes to speak, um, raise your hand and yes. Good evening and thank you. I'm Claire Hutlinger from uh, Florence, Ward, Ward 6. I have spoken to you all before, um, and I don't have a lot to add to the experts about ranked choice voting. Um, so I wasn't going to come up, but I did think of one thing I do have to add, and that's um, for the past year and a half, maybe two years, I've been working with voter choice, standing at farmers markets and parades and talking to people about it. And for the most part, people aren't informed about it. Um, it's just not something we think about between elections. Healthcare is really up. Everyone knows about it. Everyone's got an opinion. Everyone's got a friend or family member who needs it. Um, but with voter choice, it's a little different. People just don't know about this. When they hear about it, overwhelmingly, people are really all for it. They, they, you know, you see the look of relief in people's face when, they, oh, that, that's an option? You know, and so I think that since we have come this far with this, we get an, we, this is an opportunity to sort of be ahead of this wave that um, really I think is going to be good for the whole country. If we just get our local people informed about it and used to it, I think we'd do a lot for everybody else as well. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to speak? Yes, sir. <laughs> My name is Jack Jelt. I share the community of Lathrop with this wonderful lady. I'm a relative newcomer to Northampton, three years, spent most of my life abroad working in Africa. I think you shouldn't lose moments like this evening, the eloquence of everyone who's spoken, and the fervor. And I think you need to continue to plow new ground. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, 
Hi, my name's Harriet Charland. I live on Ryan Road in Florence. Um, a couple of things. One, please listen to the students. They are absolutely right and they are wonderful and so much smarter than we may think that they are. Um, as to ranked choice voting, I know there's a lot of business that goes with it, but in the end, the person who was gonna win wins. You know, I think they would win with or without frank, ranked choice voting. It, it didn't change a vote. It just gave it a different quality. But it didn't make a difference in the vote because the people who got the most votes won. So, I don't know, it's something to think about. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Can I just speak from here? No. Is that Claudia? Is that Claudia Lefko? No, Claudia, for TV purposes, you need to be at the podium. <laughs> <laughs> Cla Claudia, you're used to the limelight. Well, I just have a question, really. I mean, I came, I think one of the issues in Northampton is not that we uh, need rank uh, choice voting or not, but we really lack candidates. It's not like we have so many candidates that they're all vying for positions, but so many times we have people, you know, we have openings for a seat and the person who occupies the seat is running again and there's even no contest. So I'm here to raise the question with the committee about uh, term limits, really, because I feel like term, you know, and I'm sorry, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know. <laughs> I love you, Marianne. <laughs> but after a while, I feel like people who get into office, and I know Bill's been in office a long while as well, and I mean, this is not that easy to talk about in front of people who are good public servants for many, many years. But the truth is, I feel like after a while, it really does hinder people from jumping into the race. And we hear from these 16 year olds, I mean, I guess if you can vote, it means what? Can you run for city council or school committee? I don't know what that means. But but the truth is we really need to energize um, people to run for office. And I feel like it's discouraging if there are people who they say, oh, they've been there you know, a long time, they're doing a good job. We need the turnover of ideas, no matter how great the people are who are in office. I feel like other people also need to be to step up and take their chance to do something and it's and it's very hard to challenge somebody i mean truth is they know a lot you know but other people also have ideas and stuff so i don't know is this something that the charter commission i spoke when the charter was being uh you know reconsidered about this and i know no it, it didn't uh pass people didn't want term limits but i'm here to just raise the issue again um in terms of of this whole conversation tonight about rank uh Rank vote, rank choice voting. So, thanks. Thank you. Uh, and apologies. <laughs> yes. I'm Diana Riddle from Florence, and I just wanted to support rank choice voting. Um, I don't have anything more to add except that I do think it, it does uh, impact the outcome of elections. I think that if you have a first choice and a second choice, and the first choice gets the second choices. The, the first choice doesn't have the minor, majority, and the second choice's votes go toward that, then it will change the outcomes of elections. So I think there's a difference in that. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. I'm Bridget Glackin, and I'm on House Street in Florence, and I apologize I came late. I've given a presentation on ranked choice and on independent redistricting as part of an educational activity, so I've missed the debate. I, I'm in favor of ranked choice, but I sort of second Claudia. I don't know how relevant it is this year or next year to our issues of being more democratic in, North, in the city of Northampton. And um, I urge you, um, I have two children who are living, uh, one lives in Oregon where they have very high voter participation. They vote by mail. You know, I talked to my daughter about voting in October, and she said our vote is out. 80% of our vote is out. So we've passed that in the state, the motor uh, voter registration. And uh, I'd urge you, to, and my other child, one of my other children lives in California. They have ranked choice. They also have top two primary. 
Um, they have independent redistricting. And I urge you, as long as you're opening yourself, I mean, I'm glad that there's a group of people who have organized around ranked choice. And I think that's a lot to think about. But I think there are other ideas and other states that are using them that are really empowering people. I'm very active in the League of Women Voters, and we don't find that people are not registered. For instance, you may think we're all registered, but in Springfield they're not. That's not true. 90% of people are not registered, are registered in Springfield, 90%. But their turnouts are low. Some of ours are really low, too. And so we, there's research about that. People don't feel there's anyone to vote for, or they don't feel their vote counts. So since you're opening up this about you know, improving democracy, I think you should look at some of these other models, top two primary, independent redistricting. Actually, the districting of Northampton and the way the wards are has been controversial in the past. Supposedly, you know, creates somewhat, uh, some people think it doesn't, the ward representation isn't ideal. So as long as you're taking this on, I think I recommend you look at some of these other ideas. And, there's certainly a lot of examples where they've come forward in other states. I mean, California's done ranked choice for a number of years now, and they've done top two primary. It's easy to find. Um, I, I think all the positive points are positive, but there's easy to find critiques of unintended consequences. So I, I'm sure you will all do that, but I encourage you to look at that too. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? Okay, Patty had a question. I have a question for the presenters. Um, I have a quick, quick question, and that is, those of you who have studied um, ranked choice in Maine and other um, communities, I'm curious about what kind of um, investment there was in the re-education of voters about ranked choice once the decision was made. How, 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 were, how, how did that happen in Maine? And you can answer. <laughs> Maine had a thorough public education campaign despite some ups and downs and court challenges and the law was passed and they had to do another initiative petition. So it had a lot going on. But the League of Women Voters actually, in partnership with the state, stepped forward and did a massive public education, massive for in proportion to the state. Um, and people went in, they understood what their needs were, and when it when it gets passed in, in cities and, and that state, public education has always been part of that. When we advocate for ranked choice voting for statewide, we write in and assume that there needs to be a public education allocation. And um, League of Women Voters just played an extraordinary role in, in, in Maine and was re strongly recognized for this. And then the Secretary of State was anxious, reluctant, all sorts of things going on. And then he said it worked like a dream. Um, came in a tenth of the budget they anticipated, and people understood it, and they were, they, they were just pleased and, um, that, that voters understood. So he ended up being a, a big booster in saying um, he didn't have the time to do the fullest public education campaign because of the ups and downs that the whole initiative went, but um, <coughs> he was committed to it. And then um, extremely pleased with the results. And so I can't think of an adoption over that last 20 years when it's sort of been growing in the cities that didn't include a formal public education campaign. But in the end, it's easy as one, two, three. And so it, it's not that hard to do that public education campaign. You've just got to have the full reach of it. Yeah. Um, Liz, did you want to? Is it Liz? Yeah, you actually mentioned the studies that you looked at. Yeah, Howie, Howie touched on it. Um, they did have a, a reluctant but uh, but quickly converted to very supportive Secretary of State. And I, I wanted to mention that we also do here in Massachusetts, our Secretary of State has come out um, supportive of ranked choice voting. He's tweeted his support. Um, he said it's something we need to adopt here. And so that alone is a big, um, a big boost to the kinds of um, you know the kinds of resources that can now be allocated to um, adoption in cities and across the whole state potentially um, the other thing I wanted to add <laughs> is that we in our own voter education as we're talking about this um, concept to a lot of people who are new to it is we actually use in practice um, example 
demonstrations where we will invite people to come sample, you know, four different types of pie from the pie bar, or we'll have a beer election, or we'll have a, a rank your favorite donut. Um, we use a sample ballot, and we simply allow people to compare the options and then use a practical example to 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 do that voter education. And we found it extremely. Um, powerful people. People really love it. For one thing, it's very tasty, and the and the other is they come away saying, "That was not as hard as I thought it would be." So, because you eat the candidates, right? Bob, Howie, you mentioned that you didn't foresee any technology issues. Um, I happened to. I, I went to East Hampton when they voted to when the Charter Review Commission of East Hampton voted to support it, but it it was noted at the time that there were going to be some technology software costs for East Hampton, and it's my understanding that we use the same software that they do. So, w what makes you think that it's not going to be any additional uh, expenditure for us? I did mention software upgrade, but the complete you, Dominion, yes, is the ImageCast precinct being used in Northampton? Yes. All right. No, there is a software upgrade package. Right. I, 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 yeah. I did mention that. But it, what Dominion offers is a complete RCV suite. They, the, the ballots, um, the tabulation, the, um, the, scan, well, the scanning, obviously, and then the uh, results reporting is all streamlined and continuous and integrated. So there is a software upgrade right. for, the, for your current Dominion. Yeah, that's what I thought I heard. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> The cost of the, uh, oh, oh, may I? Can I ask, can I ask a quick oh, question? Yes, yes. Um, can you speak to any perceived unintended consequences of RCV that, that if someone were here who had a different opinion might bring up? I'm just curious. Well, we often get asked about the arguments against, and what we, we can often sum it up as institutional inertia. It's just the way things are done. And you know, when you're looking back at 230 years of the way we've done it, there were no other models. <laughs> there was no ranked choice voting. There was, so um, the issue of um, can it be gamed? Can you know? It, and the the mathematical answer is no. And, and and so that's not it. Some people say um, whoever wins the most votes, as we've always done it, which is. Um, but that just doesn't resist the, the, the urge to just do it better. And so there's not anything that is, you know, it sounds pretty naive. And, and or to say there's, um, there's nothing we can identify or have heard other than we just have done it other ways. And that's the difference. So even we've, you know, you put in preliminary elections to fix that other problem, and we saw that even that doesn't go far enough. Uh, who would have thought, you know, when you look at the large field, that the third place finisher, you know, is, 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 is compromised. And so, um, if you can always do it better, um, ranked choice voting moves it forward like that. And, and um, it would, you know, we, there was talk about uncompetitive elections. In, in Northampton, as as many places, RCV would bring out more people. Okay, but instead of being a problem, that would be the good thing. All right, it can handle the large fields. It can handle this. It can handle three people from mayor. It could handle fifteen. I will tell you, Portland, Maine adopted ranked choice voting. Their first election for mayor was 2011, and there were 15 candidates. It was an open seat, and there were 15 candidates. Everyone thought, oh, I can get there. <laughs> you know, I rank choice voting. I, I'll get the votes. Only one person could get <laughs> that majority. The next year, there were, the next four years later, there were three. Um, but no, people stepping up and running and being com making competitive elections because there's no risk of vo vote splitting, no risk of st strategizing. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. More voices and more choices. Has there ever been talk of a cap? Cap on number of candidates? Mm -hmm. um, no, because. There shouldn't be, is mm -hmm. my opinion. Betsy Hodges, who I didn't play the um, that short video I had her quote off the mayor. That was, uh, I believe, 35-person race or something like that. Most of those were not contenders, and I don't. I'm not slighting, the, you know, anything by saying that. The, the 35 is just a huge field. But we, um, 
we, uh, there's no cap because the ones who get the half a percent or the 100 votes or something, that will happen. And then the system moves on. And you'll have, out of a massive field, you'll have the seven or eight trying to jockey with, um, and the choices will boost only one of them. So I would, I would have to say no to a cap. Dominion, I should also add, there's been a lot of analysis on how many rankings actually go into electing people. Um, in Cambridge, which has a nine-seat council, 95% um, see one of their first three candidate uh, choice preferences. One of their first three choices elected. You see when you look at the number of rankings, you see it goes up from um, very few with one, couple with two, three is a spike, all right? People sort of get that. And then there's another spike for nine, because that's the number. But um, some people go really deep in the rankings, but it just generally doesn't make a difference. It doesn't get there. The Dominion package has a default. The RCV package with that software upgrade has a default of 10 rankings, a limit. In Voter Choice Massachusetts, we would say that's extremely reasonable. There's, it's not going to, you know, uh, if, it, if there's 15 people, ranking 11, 12, 13 is just not going to make a difference in the election in practical terms. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a limit mm -hmm. we could live with as a practical attached to your, your Dominion equipment. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Uh, yes. Hi, I'm Andy Anderson, uh, also with Board of Choice Massachusetts. I uh, just wanted to add a few things to uh, your question. There are, uh, one of the arguments is voter fatigue in some sense, that there's too many candidates, you can't look through all of them. And the important point I would think is that you do know a group of candidates who you're interested in typically, and you can rank them. And your vote is generally gonna go help to coalesce them into a number of electable candidates instead of splitting the votes. So even if you don't rank all the way down through the list, you are still benefiting from having ranked choice voting in place. Um, the, I guess the other thing is one, one way you limit, if you did want to limit the number of candidates, you could require more petitions, sig uh, signatures to be turned in. I don't know if you want to do that because of you have to see how it, how it works in a particular situation, but that is an option. Um, New Hampshire for, is famously for its presidential primary. There is no signature gathering requirement. You just pay $1,000 and you can get on the ballot, and they have like 30 candidates you know, running in the primaries. Um, so that is something that could be uh, make the candidates, potential candidates, really show that they have some support. Um, the other argument that I've heard that has, well, most of the arguments stem from not quite understanding how ranked choice voting works, so I won't worry about that. But one other argument is that uh, some people will say, well, um, ranked choice voting uh, requires a candidate both have core support and broad support. So they have to have enough core support that they're getting first choice votes, and then they can coalesce to get a majority and get that broad support. Um, and they say, some people will say, well, that means that everyone's second choice can't win. Right, um, and that's true because if they're if they're the second choice out of everyone, they're going to have no first choice, and they'll be the first person eliminated. Um, so it's a balance. We want we do want candidates that are going to, you know, get a little fire behind them from the uh, electorate right off the bat. Um, that's that's still an important part of our uh, electoral system. So I think that that's an important feature that we do expect to see. You know, good first choice. Uh, percentage before you can win. You. Other questions from the committee? No? Let me uh, c conclude by uh, thanking everyone who came tonight and participated and listened. So I want to thank people watching at home and say that our work continues. We have eight more months ahead of us to review the charter. And we're reviewing all of the, the charter, not just the issues surrounding elections. We meet regularly the first and third Tuesday of each month at 6.30, second floor <coughs> room at City Hall. 
We welcome public comment at those meetings, so anyone who wants to come and address us on anything related to the municipal charter is, is welcome to do so. Thank you.